Our first presenter is Elizabeth Ezekiel. Elizabeth is a double major in art history and English. She's been mentored in this work by Professor Jonathan Sherland in the Department of Art and Art History. The title of Elizabeth's presentation is Primitivism and the Modern Woman in Transnational Modernist Painting, circa 1900 to 1939. talking about the specifics of my research, I want to briefly talk about the term primitivism itself. It's not a very common term we use in our everyday language. I know I didn't know what it meant a year ago. Um, thankfully, Dr. Sherlin taught me about it. But it's this movement in the 19th and 20th century rooted in a fascination with cultures that Western civilization deemed primitive, putting it bluntly. Not surprisingly, these are cultures mainly of African or Oceanic origin, and this movement, this fetish, this genre of art that emerges, really stems from a need of European colonial and imperialist powers needing to justify their own colonial settlement. And so they did this by determining who we are going to poise as the other, who we are going to say is less than us. As you can imagine, this is also very much so bound up in white supremacist efforts, um, and that is something we will talk about over these next couple minutes. The key question of my study is how did transnational female artists, transnational meaning women who spent significant periods of time in more than one country, how did they approach primitivism in the early 20th century, and how did these discourses impact their representations of the female body? The thematic lens I employed was opposition versus compliance. In other words, how did they both make works that move towards and against these aesthetic tropes based in primitivist ideology? The theoretical lenses I used were critical race theory and feminist theory because this was an intersectional study. So I wanted to employ different um, paths of thought. The first artist I want to talk about is Paula Motors and Becker. She lived from 1876 to 1907. She mainly lived in Germany, but also spent time in France and England. Now, I want to first direct our attention to the image on your right. <laughs> and with this image and these two images together, I want us to think about time together. And by that, I mean I want us to think about life and death, how they're similar, how they're different and also how we can paint this idea of life and death. She's a painter, as you can see. So this right portrait is incredibly famous in art history. And the reason for that is it is the first nude self-portrait painted by a woman. It's very exciting. <laughs> but what's also really fascinating about it, as a hopeful future art historian, is that she was not, in fact, pregnant at the time that she painted this. It's unusual. Why would you paint a portrait of yourself pregnant? when you're not pregnant. Scholars disagree about this. There's lots of different suggestions. There's lots of different hypotheses about it. But after reading through her notes and really investing myself in her legacy and her life, I believe that this was her way that she saw herself as the most beautiful. This was her version of idealized womanhood. She believed that a woman needed to bear children in order to be a true woman. So whether you agree or disagree with that, that's what she believed. And so by painting herself as pregnant, even without ever needing to be pregnant, she could eternalize her body, eternalize her life, eternalize her form in this state of epitomized beauty. Now moving on to this diagram on your left. What we have here is a comparative diagram between a portrait she made in 1906, I should know that, and then this is an Egyptian um, mummy portrait. So how are these related? Well, if you accept what I just said about this being about eternalizing life, the next question is, okay, can we eternalize death? I think we can. And I would suggest to you that the way that you can eternalize death is through this artistic practice made by the Fayum people in Egypt, which began around the 30s and 40s in CE, so the first century. And this practice was a way of painting the portrait of the deceased and laying it over their mummified body essentially masking the deceased and eternalizing their image. 
So what we see here in this diagram is a direct submersion of portrait elements, meaning the location and proportion of facial features, from these Egyptian portraits onto her own. So not only is this a huge and remarkable, significant achievement as an artist that she was able to so directly take influence of works from 2,000 years before her, but it's really critical when she did this. So she was doing these works in you know, 1906, 1907, but even earlier, as a house mother images would dictate. And she's doing this three to four years before other male modernists became invested in African art. So what does that mean? The woman did it first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next artist that I'm going to talk to you about is Lewis Milo Jones. She's an African-American artist from right around here because she grew up in Boston and on the vineyard. So we see her here in this central image. This is a photograph of her in her Parisian studio in 1938. Now I've enlarged two images on the side, sort of circled here. And my study focuses on her growth as an artist before, during, and after she studies abroad in Paris. That's a photograph of her in Paris. And so what I argue in my paper, and what I learned through the study, is that while she feels certain levels of discomfort towards her African-American subjects before she travels abroad, when she returns, she's much more comfortable depicting dignified representations of blackness and of black identity. We see one such work here, and then on the flip side, we see a more uncomfortable depiction of blackness here. The men are faced away from her, their identities are blurred, and they're also nude, signifying a more readiness to perhaps objectify them or comply with aesthetic tropes we see in other art created by white artists of this period. The last artist I want to talk to you is Irma Stern. Excuse me, I want to talk to you about is Irma Stern. She lived from 1894 to 1966 and split her time between Germany and South Africa along with a multitude of other countries. She was by far the most well-traveled artist in the study. This image here, sorry, I'll pull up the description. There we go. This image here is called The Water Carriers. It's a 1935 oil painting. What's curious about this is that these women are not water carriers. They're not even carrying water at all. What they're carrying are beer pots known as easing kamba. How do we know this? Well, the darkened color of the vessel signifies the way in which they were fired, and that technique was used to make beer pots. We also see a woven like, top or lid over one of them, which wouldn't necessarily be used for water. And then also the presence of such elaborate jewelry tells us that these women were walking on the way to some type of celebration, a ritual perhaps, um, anything like that. So they wouldn't necessarily be carrying water to that. It's much more likely that they would be carrying beer. So why is it significant that this was misnamed? Well, on the one hand, she's painting this really beautiful representation of indigenous life. She's painting these indigenous women with remarkable accuracy, remarkable detail in the jewelry, in the fact that they're traveling in a group, in their dress, in the way that they're carrying the pots. So there's a lot of accuracy here. There's also misnaming. And so it's a good effort but it's not quite there. And that's exactly what we're seeing come up time and time again, is yes, she's opposing perhaps white male standards of art in this period, which would just say, let's paint nude black women. She's going one step further, and she's offering a more accurate view of indigenous life, but she's still misnaming it. All right, and then, What's next? So if there is going to be one takeaway from all this, I know I've tried to cover a 100-page paper in eight minutes. <laughs> um, I hope that you remember that these women artists were truly remarkable. I'm kind of obsessed with all of them. <laughs> They're so fascinating. And it's so wonderful to think, oh, oh, thank you, good night. It's amazing to see how they were able to create such disruptive sets of works in spite of all the challenges they faced. The racism they faced, the classism, the gender discrimination, all of it.
they traveled to different places, they were vulnerable as women travelers, but they did it and they made it. And it's remarkable what they were able to do. I'm really excited to continue this work through my honor thesis with my wonderful mentor, Dr. Sherland. It's been an incredible summer working together. And I'm really excited to see where it takes us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 